to the secret of David. He knew that David had ordered Uriah into the heat of the battle in order to get him out of the way that he might take the wife of Uriah. Yes, King, uh, or King David felt the strong hand of this man, General Joab, over him. And the general wielded a powerful hand over the king. He could go in and out of the court as he pleased. He was completely unafraid. He brushed aside the courtiers in the court to see the king. By his strategy and cleverness, he enlarged the kingdom of David. But he made the days and hours for the king very miserable. And then when this King David died, a new king came into power, King Solomon. And King Solomon immediately set out to carry out the command of his father David. And word reached General Joab that he was no longer the commander of the Israelite army. Word reached him that the new king was going to slay him. And panic-stricken, this general who was composed in the battle scene rushed into the temple of the church and took hold of the horn, one of the four horns that was on the altar. And as he was hanging on to this horn, in came the man who was to kill him. And when Benaniah saw it, he went out and went to King Solomon and said, I, I can't kill this man. He's hanging on to the horn, the horn on the altar. It was supposed to be a symbol of security and sureness. And Joab felt so long as he was hanging on to this horn, he was safe. Solomon said, fall on the man. And as a result, Benaniah went back again and with his sword slew this man, General Joab. In this little incident is a very unusual insight into life and to religion. In the Bible, we find that there are many symbols of religion, the candles, symbolized God as the light of the world. There were sacrifices of meal offering of lambs and oxen. These symbolized the sacrifices to be made. The lamb was the symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Messiah to come. There were other also symbols which they employed, and the horn was one of them. It is not so common among us. But the horn symbolized security and strength and sureness. And when the writer of the gospel, Luke, wrote that the Lord has raised up to us a horn of salvation, the people who read it of that time immediately understood what he meant, that this new Messiah or Christ was a form of security and sureness. Now the horn that was on the altar that Joab took hold of was a symbol of security, but it wasn't security itself. And one of the errors that people have made all down through the centuries has been that the symbol of security is confused with the actual thing itself. The flag is the symbol of the United States, but it is not the United States. The candles are the symbol of Christ, the light of the world. But the candles are not the light of the world. They merely symbolize it. A man may hold a candle in his hand, and he may walk around with it lighted as a symbol of Christ, the light of the world, and yet he himself may have none of that light in himself. It is possible for us to have a beautiful gold cross on the altar, shiny and looking beautiful, and ornamenting our church as a symbol of the crucifixion of Jesus and that he gave himself for us and that Christianity is symbolized in the cross. We may hold this cross aloft and we may praise it and bow to it, and yet not possess anything of what the cross stands for. And all down through the ages, people have been doing, just like General Joab, of clinging to the symbol or hanging on to the horn, thinking that herein they have what the horn symbolizes, but they do not possess it. We're living in a time when people are doing exactly that. We're living in a time when people are clinging to things believing that in them they shall find security. Jung, the noted psychologist, says that every man seeks security and he must be secure. The smallest child and the oldest person must have security. When you see a nervous small child, you can be sure the child hasn't found security at home. When you find an older person who is whining and complaining, 
Anne is reverting back in many ways to being a child, but with the cunning of an aged person. You will find that that aged person doesn't have a sense of belonging or sureness or security. It is true of all of us we must have this feeling of sureness. When a baseball player steps up to the plate to swing at the ball, his feet must be firmly braced. And if they are not firmly braced, he cannot swing with the solidity at the ball as it comes to him. If he's standing on slippery ice, he may just barely touch the ball or miss it completely. A golf player is no good not when he loses the strength of his hand or his arms, but when he can cease to stand firmly on the ground in his legs, the strength must be. Well, there must be a foundation to a building. There must be security to life. And we search for it and grope for it and long for it for all our days. Some years ago, there was printed in the Reader's Digest an interesting item. And I happened to talk to the doctor before it was printed in the Reader's Digest. A doctor in Milwaukee observing that some infants in an orphan's home were not gaining their proper weight. Ordered the nurses to hold the babies when they were being fed. And instantly, the babies gained the weight that they should gain. In other words, those tiny infants felt the security that came as they were held by these nurses. And so it is with every tiny baby. It isn't long before a tiny baby knows the embrace of the mother. It isn't long before a child senses the feeling of security in the home, or if there's insecurity. If there's calling and bickering between the parents, if there's insecurity in that home, the child senses it. He may not know what's going on. He cannot understand the argument. He does not know the seriousness of it. But he feels it. And it isn't long before he's on edge. And he's nervous and perhaps loses his appetite and cannot eat or has a running nose or a cold constantly or some other evidences of the fact that he does not have security. We all must have security. I remember reading the memoirs of a nurse during the First World War, and in it she told of a little lad who followed her from room to room in one of the places where she was taking care of orphan children. And she asked the little fellow, what are you following me for? Are you hungry? No. Do you want some clothes? No. Why are you following me then? I am following you, he said, because I want to be near somebody who cares for me. I want to be near someone who cares for me. And I don't care who the child is, how small or how poor, or how rich. He hungers for someone who loves him and cares for him. And often the toughest youngster, and often the meanest lad, and the boy who's smashing property and throwing stones at buildings, he's getting back at society because it doesn't love him. And when you read in the newspaper about a child who smashed buildings or broken into a school, and smash the property, it is because he is instinctively fighting back at this world which ceases to love him and gives him a feeling of belonging. Everyone desires this feeling of security. Everyone must have this feeling that he belongs and is wanted. I like to tell of one time when I was in a department store and there was a little boy that was lost. And he was crying and I put him on my shoulder and I stepped up on the steps and I could feel his little legs trembling against my side. And when he spotted his mother instantly, the trembling stopped because the feeling of security was restored. We all must have this from the cradle to the grave, a feeling of security. And if we don't have it, if there begins to be mistrust in the home, if there begins to be insecurity in the job, if there's insecurity in our health, immediately upsets the equilibrium of the personality and we cannot function at our best. There are times in history when people believe that uh, insecurity is more common than at other periods. There are those who believe that we are in such a period now, that we're living at a time when people feel very insecure. They point to the long, drawn-out peace negotiations in Korea, the unsettled relationship between Russia and the United States, they point out the scare headlines in the newspapers and the people who toy with the idea of war merely for the sake of saying something over the radio. They point to the rabble-rousers on the radio who like to get us excited and think war is going to break out tomorrow. 
They point out the uncertainty of scientific invention. The atom bomb and perhaps the H-bomb. And we get into a state of mind where we're ready to believe anything will happen. Flying saucers become a reality at certain times. We imagine men from Mars to descend upon our planet. We are susceptible to any kind of a crazy idea because of the insecurity which prevails among us. There was the uncertainty of the scene in Europe. What will Europe do if uh, a war were to break out? And then there is the ceaseless and feverish military preparation on the part of the United States. And this endless feeling that we've got to spend all that we have for our military security. Mr. Kreuther, Geoffrey Kreuther, writing in the London Economist, and he's considered an authority in the world, said it's quite possible by our military program it will lead us on into destruction. And Lenin said in 1924, we shall force the United States to spend herself into destruction. And at the same time, too, we are observing with a certain degree of uneasiness that the nations of the world are not loving us. We discover, as Frank Laubach said not so long ago, a man who travels around the world as a Christian and teaches people how to read and write. And he's taught millions of people how to read and write in their own language. He said we are creating around the world hatred towards us because of our military preparation. And the very thing that we think is going to give us a feeling of security is creating insecurity in the world. Yes, there is a period through which we're passing which makes us feel that we are insecure. That is why we talk so constantly about pensions, social security, safety glass, plenty of money in the bank, enough insurance, Blue Shield, Blue Cross, all have their place, perhaps, to a certain degree, but it's the emphasis of our particular time which is the disturbing thing in our minds. And sometimes I wonder if the United States is getting old, if we've lost our pioneer spirit, if we've lost something of our freshness. We're so desperately afraid of being different. I was disappointed when I read that in our universities and colleges that there are very few radical groups. Why, it is the radical people who made things in the past. The men who started the Revolutionary War were called radicals. Now any man that's worth his salt at some time or other in his life was something of a radical. He believed he was going to change the world when he was a college student at the university. They don't have a great deal of power, but they can blow off a lot of steam, and that's the place to do it. And the constant pressure for security on the world in the world of business, in the world of politics, has led to stagnation, losing of the pioneer spirit and the something of the daring which made our country the great nation that it is. Our fear of Russia and the constant hounding on the subject of communism on the part of some men has crushed and destroyed men who dare to think independently and our intellectual and social liberals have been scurrying away for fear of being crushed. It ought not to be that way. It is the men who are daring in the field of science that make new discoveries. It is the men who are daring in the field of politics who make new and just laws. It is the men who are daring who have made democracy and established it. That was something new when it was started. Always there must be the growing edge of a man's mind. Not in that growing edge it's always dangerous. Yes, I wonder if the United States is getting old because we're thinking too much in terms of security. And this much I want to say to you people, that there never has been a time of complete security. And when you have it, you have stagnation and death. The people in the penitentiary are the most secure, but who wants to be in the penitentiary? Death is the most secure of all. To be in the grave, you're free from all the hazards of this life. And some people think when they're comfortable and all hedged in and all protected and all secure, they're going to discover happiness. If, like Job, they can hang on to this horn, then they will have salvation, but instead it means death. Then also we've had a wave in our country in the past few years of books on peace of mind, such splendid books as Peace of Mind by Joshua Liebman 
or books like Confident Living or How to Get Rid of Fear or How to Live with Yourself and a multitude of other books on peace of mind. Now the European, when he comes to this country, is quite shocked to see all these books. They feel that if anybody ought to be upset, they ought to with their poverty and threat of war. And they don't have these books circulating among them. And they wonder what's the matter with the American people who have so much wealth and so much the abundance of this world's goods and great military power, and yet they have no peace of mind and are constantly reading these books which are sold endlessly and in abundance upon the marketplace. Some people imagine that if you get the right psychic massage, that the psychiatrist can somehow give you a trick, twist to your mind, and then you'll discover peace of mind. That if you can rearrange your attitudes in a certain way, it will be accomplished. Or there are theologians in all branches of religion who say, here's a book on questions and answers. Here are the questions and here are the answers. And if you've got a neat little book explaining this universe and life itself, and everything about it, you'll take this book and put it under your arm, and you'll have peace of mind. No, I don't think so. I don't think you'll have peace of mind by any neat explanation of the universe. Oh, it's possible for a person to live and die on this earth in luxury and comfort, and with a certain psychic massage. I think it's possible to live and die, just as the followers of Hitler did live and die, believing that Hitler was God. During the Battle of the Bulge, one of the German planes came to the earth crashing, and out of it, badly wounded, came a German soldier. He raised his broken hand up to his head and saluted and said, Praise be to Hitler, and dropped over dead. He gave an intense loyalty and devotion to Adolf Hitler, and some people think intense devotion to a little explanation of the universe like Hitler's or some church. That is religion. Clinging to this horn on the altar as did King Joab, but one can be slain just as well. Where then is the security to be found? I don't think it is found in any explanation of the universe, fellow Christians. If you're looking for peace through an explanation, you will be disappointed. For there is no explanation that can satisfy our minds. The finite mind will seek for understanding, but he'll find no explanation. You may say, what is electric light? And back of it, uh, well, you'll have to explain what is electricity. And then you'll stop there and say, I don't know. You may say, uh, here is a flower. But what is the flower? It's a rose. But what's a rose? And how does a rose grow? You stop there. The finite mind comes up against a stone wall if he's trying to find an explanation to this world and what takes place in it. But that need not hinder him from finding security. And that is why the author of the Gospel, Luke, said, God has raised up for us a horn of salvation in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus gives us this feeling of security in a quite totally different process. At the end of the gospel lesson which was read to you, it said there that the purpose of this security and this horn of salvation was that we should serve the Lord without fear and with holiness and righteousness all our days. I believe that the purpose of every man on this earth is to serve God, and it is to serve him with holiness and righteousness and without fear. When Peter had finished his sermon, when he had completed the sermon of Pentecost, the people who were converted came up and said, Brethren, what shall we do? Action was a thing. What shall we do? How shall we perform? Action is the necessary thing. And when... Jesus came to the disciples after his resurrection. They came to him and said, Hast thou now come to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said, It's not given for you to know the times nor the season, but it is for you to go forth and make disciples of all nations, beginning here and then going to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus didn't give explanations. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And so people, if we're groping and searching for explanations of what happens or what takes place upon this earth, we'll sooner or later be entangled in a mass and we'll find the soul will be restless and uncertain. I think we discover our security through serving, through serving God. It's much more fun, isn't it, 
to play a game of golf than to look at a game of golf. I should think if a person could play the piano, it would be much more satisfying to sit down and play the piano if it were only a simple piece than to sit there and run a player piano. But we have turned it about in our civilization. We have been led to believe that if a man is comfortable, he will find peace and security when he only finds stagnation. We have been led to believe that if a person is entertained and he laughs at the entertainment and for the moment he has pleasure, that he has found true enjoyment and peace. That is why we crowd around our television sets and when company comes, we, we do not want to be disturbed. We want to look at the television set. That is why we want to be entertained at the football game. I was quite interested in reading what an athlete said in the Rose Bowl contest. He said, I am not so interested in just putting on a spectacle to entertain the people, that we should have this extra game and play this football to entertain the public and to please the public. But the public wants to be entertained. They want to see things, read things, have things done for them. And in the long run, there can be no real satisfaction in life, no peace, no security to a person. Sooner or later, he gets satiated and bored and tired. The fun of living is to live. The fun of living is to be down in the arena. It is to be taking part. It is to be doing the simplest task. That is the fun of living. To create something, to create something with your hands, to create something with your mind, so that your brain fibers and your body are part of something which you've made and created. Why is it that little children playing in the parlor floor with little blocks can create fire engines and trains and battles? Why is it that a little child can have more fun perhaps with a peanut shell and the water in the bathtub, imagining it is a sailboat than with a new and a fancy sailboat given to him by his rich parents? Because the child creates something with the peanut shell he creates something with those blocks in the parlor floor. He puts himself into it and he becomes a part of it and he has the satisfaction of creation. Not so long ago, we listened to a fine concert by our choir, Christmas at Central. And I thank the singers, but really I think the singers should have thanked us because certainly they had the greatest enjoyment out of it all. They created the concert. They created the music. They created it. And what a satisfaction it must be to be in a choir, to create an anthem that inspires the soul. That is the satisfaction of life always. It is not in being entertained. It is not in having somebody do something for you, but it is in doing something for yourself. And George Washington Carver prayed to God, God, teach me the mystery of the peanut. The voice came back to him according to George Washington Carver saying, I gave you brains, George Washington Carver, use them and find out for yourself. And that is the way God runs this universe. He has made this universe and here it is. We must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is not going to drop things from the sky. We do not believe in a religion of magic. We do not believe in somehow praying and things will suddenly fall for you. But it is only by the hard, difficult process of sweat and toil and labor that we shall discover the mysteries of this universe and harness them to serve our fellow men and to serve one another. If we think in terms of entertainment, if we degenerate religion into symbolism and think it is only something that's to entertain us and something pretty, pretty, it will not be long before religion itself will escape us. And like Job, we will hang on to the horn and discover it doesn't save our lives at all. Creativeness is the fun of life. If it's only baking a cake, if it's only sewing a dress, if it's only rearing a family, and those are not small things. They are important in their place. If it's creating a picture with a brush, if it's singing a song, if it's preparing a speech, it's making a garment, building a farm, putting up a building, it is creation. And here this morning we broke ground for our new Sunday school building. The satisfaction comes to us and to all of us that we're creating something. We're not standing still and stagnant. And then creative goodness, working together with somebody. You may create something bad of which you're ashamed. 
or you may create something good of which you're proud and thankful. You'll always discover the good things you're not ashamed to tell anyone about, but the evil things you're ashamed to tell. Yes, creative goodness and cooperation with other people. That is what Jesus Christ taught us, to serve him in holiness and in righteousness to the end of our days and to do it without fear. That is the horn of salvation. Jesus Christ has taught us the way of security, not in possessions, not in a psychic massage, but he will provide all the security we need to accomplish the purposes he wants us to accomplish. You may have much or little, but he'll give you enough. You may be brilliant or not brilliant, but he'll give you enough brains. He'll give you all that you need to serve him. When the Apostle Paul prayed Almighty God that he would remove his particular affliction, three times says Paul that he prayed that God would remove this affliction, we believe it to be a bad eyesight. The voice came back and said, My grace is sufficient for thee. And in all the storm and stress and strife of his life, Paul found when he came to the situation, God was always there with sufficient security for the problem. There then is what we must remember. People, it's this, we must have a sense of duty. You must say as a choir singer, it is my duty to be at rehearsal. You must say to yourself as a mother, it is my duty to be the right sort of a mother. You must say as a merchant, it is my duty to be an honorable Christian merchant. You must say as an usher, it is my duty to be there at my task and assume my responsibility. Life has in it a sense of duty. And the Christian who is truly a Christian and who believes in serving God and serving him to the end of his days will have to say to himself, I'll accept this course. It doesn't make any difference what happens to me or to mine, what happens to my property or even to myself. I must pursue my course. I must fulfill my duty in the sight of God. We must serve him to the end in holiness and righteousness. Then will come security. Security that's infinitely more than the symbols on the altar. Infinitely more than the symbols of the horn to which King Joab was clinging so foolishly. And like a lot of foolish people, he thought the symbols consisted of religion. But it's not religion. It is to lay hold of Jesus Christ, to think his thoughts and to live his life, and to be a faithful servant of his with a deep sense of duty. Then there comes that peace of which he said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth.